Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, I want to say good afternoon to those of you who are joining me here on the East Coast. It's just after 12 noon Eastern time. I also want to say good morning to those of you who may be joining us from the central time zones, the mountain time zones, or the Pacific time zones. And of course, we want to say good evening if any of you are joining us from across the pond in parts of UK or parts of Europe. And of course, good early morning for any of you who are joining us maybe in parts of Asia or Australia. Well, welcome to today's radioactive trading presentation. Uh, today, we're going to discuss how to call the market top. And of course, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike Chupka. I am the Director of Education at Power Options and at RadioactiveTrading.com. Uh, I've essentially been trading options uh, since about 2000, 2001, so for about 16 years now. Uh, many of you, of course, have heard me on other presentations, both radioactive and for power options as well. But all right, let's get started. Now, here at Power Options, and of course radioactive trading, uh, Ernie, myself, and the staff, we do receive a lot of questions, a lot of emails regarding market movement, market direction, and of course the potential for market corrections. Anytime we see a three to four to five month consistent gain in the broad-based markets, whether we're talking about looking at SPY or looking at NDX, for example, the NASDAQ 100, um, or a, maybe even the Russell 2000, everyone starts to concern and everyone starts to think well we're bound for a correction there's always different market situations but the main questions come up is how long is the market going to continue up before it pulls back when is the market going to correct how long of course and how deep will said correction last if there is one of course you know and will it be a two-week downturn a one-week downturn a three-month downturn do we expect a 10% drop in the market as a whole or a 20% or do we expect if the market's been up let's say 10 or 15% do we expect it to give up half of that amount and then of course with that in mind we don't know necessarily when the correction is going to happen how deep it's going to be how long it's going to last how should you manage a position any position really it doesn't have to be a long stock it could be a long call it could be a credit spread could be anything along those lines. Well, these are all great questions, and these are questions I'd ask others as well. But honestly, I don't have an answer to the first three. I don't know when a correction is going to come. I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't know how far it's going to drop. But I do have an answer for the fourth question. How should we manage our position? And that's what we're going to look at today. Right? So we know that the market's been up, but essentially we also know everyone has individual goals for trading, and everyone has risk tolerance. Some of you out there might be speculating with long calls or long options, maybe trading straddles around the latest earnings season to profit in one direction or the other if you had a large enough move. Others of you may be doing credit spreads, which have a high probability get a small net credit, but it still might be a leveraged return of let's say 11, 12, or 15 percent. But at the same time, you may be taking on a 10 to 1 risk reward ratio. But in a situation where you maybe have done a bull put credit spread, maybe you've done just a covered call, maybe you just own stock in the position, we're faced with a dilemma. Should we sell now, take our profit off the table, and potentially miss more? Should we hang on to the position, whether we expire in three days from now, or whether we're out to March 17th, about 20 days from now, or more? Should we hang on and hope the position stays where it is? Or should we go ahead and delve into endless hours of technical analysis, scrolling through different charts on our individual stock or on the broad-based market to see what we think, what matches our goals, and what matches our risk tolerance? Okay. Now, Ben, I see your comment and I see your question, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. Uh, ben says, oh, we'll sell a long-term covered call. We're going to take a look at that. We're going to take a look at others as well. Now, we know where we are in the market right now. In the past three months, we did have a pullback on the SPY. Uh, so right around you know, December, beginning of December, we were looking at the SPY, SPX around 
2,200, 220 for the SPY. Now, it's hovering around 237. On February 22nd, last week, it's just above 235. Okay, so it was a gain of $16 from 220 to 236-ish, a gain of about $16 or roughly 7.2%. But we know that the broad-based indicators sort of indicate the market as a whole. It reflects the rising tide. As the broad-based indexes move up, naturally most of your stocks are probably moving up as well. With or without the effect of earnings, many stocks are up more. Over that same time period we just looked at for SPY from December 1st to February 22nd, we've seen Apple move from 109.50 to about 137. So we have a gain of about 27, 28 dollars or so, or 24 or 25 percent. Uh, Alphabet, of course, G-O-O-G-L, is up from 764 to about 852. So it's a large gain monetarily of 88 dollars. Of course, it's only 11.4 percent gain. I say only an 11.4% gain, but some of us, of course, should be so lucky from time to time to see that on a consistent basis. IBM up about 13.3%, and uh, BABA from December 1st to February 22nd up about 16%, all right? So from 89.85 to 104.20. All right, now, of course, not every stock is up. Over that same time period, Starbucks, for example, moved relatively neutral around 58.51 to 57.57, show you one point move, but it did have a high of 59.20 and a low of 53.90. And of course, some stocks have been affected by poor earnings. One of mine that I'm in right now, UBNT, has dropped from $64. My cost basis was 61.75, but it's dropped from 64 it's down to about $49 in that same time period even less actually from January 27th to February 22nd, moved from a high of 64 to a low of about 48.60. Okay, so not every stock is gonna be affected, but we're here to talk about the market top. And of course, how can we call the market top on our bullish strategies before the decline? It's gonna be through technical indicators on the stock, are we going to evaluate broad-based market indicators, seeing performance of the uh, SPX, SPY, the Dow, for example? Are you going to delve into candlesticks, different forms of chart reading, and additional, I should say, in addition to uh, different technical indicators? Do you, when you start seeing news articles that the market's bound to go up more and it's bound to go up farther, is that an indication for you to be uh, sort of counter to the market pundits? and think that there's going to be a correction. But if you start seeing a lot of articles and a lot of videos perhaps on expecting the correction when it's going to fall, do you take that at face value and decide, hey, these news guys and these pundits are right, I've got to prepare for a downturn? Or do you use a market indicator tool or sort of a market sentiment tool similar to what we have on power options? So these are some ways that you might plan that, but I want to know real quick. Let's just launch a quick poll, ladies and gentlemen. How do you call the market top? How do you decide that maybe it's run out of steam, that the growth that we've seen is going to hesitate or is going to pull back? Do you use technical indicators on your stock, maybe talking about Bollinger Bands, uh, slow or fast stochastics, MACD, for example? Do you look at broad-based market indicators, maybe the total number of days that the SPY, NDX, Russell 2000 has been up? or how much the SPY or so forth is above uh, a 20-day or a 50-day moving average. Uh, do you listen to what the news or the pundits say? Do you pay attention to that? Maybe you uh, follow CNBC, uh, different financial news, VectorVest. I know a lot of my customers here at Power Options also use VectorVest in the different lists that they use as well. Do you use a market direction tool? of some kind, an indicator that gives you buy warnings, sell warnings, maybe flashing green lights and flashing red lights lets you know that the market's up and the market's down. Some of you on power options, you know that I use the market sentiment tool uh, to manage my existing positions, to get into new positions, or to get out of current positions uh, based on what we see on the sentiment tool there. And of course, maybe you just follow a gut feeling. And with gut feeling, the hope and pray, what I also mean by that is maybe you're using a little bit of everything, which is perfectly fine, and then based on that and based on what you feel the market's doing, you make a decision whether to adjust positions, 
close positions or manage the positions in a different way. All right, well, I've had the poll open for a little bit over a minute. Not everyone has voted, but I'm going to close it down here and share the results because we want to move on to the further details. Now, this is interesting, and uh, I'm kind of happy with this results. It's kind of what I expected a little bit. 53% of you use the technical indicators on your stocks. You probably have a uh, different system. What I mean by that, and I should clarify, is that uh, of the 53% of you that said you're using technical indicators, if I took that group and put us in a room and said, here's a chart system, show me the technical indicators you use on your chart. If we had 100 users there, 53 of them said technical indicators, I'd probably get 53 different charts. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Some of you would have similarities in there, but everyone does it a little bit differently. Now, 26% of you say that you use the broad-based indicators, broad-based market indicators and the different indexes or ETFs. 5% uh, of you use the news and what pundits say. 5% of you use a market direction tool or that you have a tool that, uh, I should say a service that maybe gives you buy and sell warnings. And 11% of us follow a gut feeling or maybe use a combination of everything that's there. All right. Well, that's fantastic. There is no right or wrong answer, of course, remember. Just wanted to see and let everyone know how everyone else might approach this. All right. Now, of course, what if I told you that my approach is kind of none of the above? All right. We've all been duped by signals, trend lines, pundit prognostications, and more. Many of you who are using technical indicators, you know that those that worked maybe six months ago, maybe before what we might call the Trump rally, the end of November, middle of November going forward, a little hiccup here and there in December, I should say end of uh, November, beginning in December, and then back up again, we know that we can't necessarily use the same indicators that we open stocks at that point to open stocks or open call positions, buy options today that work the same. Market is ever changing and is ever dynamic. A lot of my customers will ask, what is the one technical or fundamental indicator that will give me 100% winners? There isn't one. There may be a combination of several that will give you a better gauge and lead you to a better success rate than maybe what you're doing now. But I have not seen in the market one indicator, one thing that will always lead you to profit on the bull side, on the bear side, or the neutral side because it's ever changing and ever moving. And of course, where are we now? We're in a position where some of us may be expecting a correction. Others of us may still be expecting the stocks and the market as a whole to continue to move up. But we don't know when the correction might happen. We don't know how much it'll happen or for how long. We also don't know when are we going to hit the market top so we can have the better timing. Okay. All right, I just had a comment come in from Frank, and Frank says, uh, have been doing research using compound indicators for call tops. Does work, but if it mar market continues up, the indicator becomes short-term. Think the problem is knowing if it's a strong trend or a weak trend. Frank, that's also true. And, uh, you know, going back to what I said about different combinations of different indicators, some of them are going to be short-term and some of them are going to be long-term. Can you catch the short-term in time? And even if you have a long-term where it's going to be a profit, let's say you have an indicator that you feel consistently has shown you that over a two and a half, maybe three month time frame, let's call it 90 days to 75 days, the indicators you've been using point to that sort of range. Well, do you get out at 80 days? Do you get out at 85? Do you wait the full 90? Does it always work out? That's the trick. Okay, we just don't know. So, how can we call the market top? We have a position that is profitable. Let's call it a stock. Let's call it a long call. Maybe even a strangle where the stock has moved up. Your put's worthless. Your long call's got a profit. You could close it out now. So, let's talk about how would you right now Let's say you have a 15% gain in the stock, which may equate to a 40 or 50% gain in a call, or maybe even a 30% gain in a strangle or a straddle. Here we are at a gain. What do you do now? Do you liquidate and take the profit on the position? Use your indicators to get into a new position. 
do you close half or part of the trade and leave the rest open, of course, based on your direction? Do you sell a call, maybe create a calendar spread against the long call or protected calendar against the straddle or a covered call against your stocks to generate income? Do you add more shares, maybe looking for higher profit? Uh, some of you who might be trading long calls, I should have run that poll to see what everyone's trading, but some of you who might be doing long calls, you may go with the ladder technique where let's say I bought a call at 50 and the stock moved up to 52, then I bought another 52 and a half call and it went up to 55 and I bought another 55 for example. Uh, so you do add more calls, add more options or add more shares looking for further upside. Or now that we have a gain, 15% or so, we might have seen on SPY for example, let's say it moved up from 220 to 236, do we set a trailing stop at maybe 232 or 230 to get us out of a position but still have further upside as well. And of course we'll also say do nothing. Okay ladies and gentlemen, sorry about that. Now a little bit more than half of you have voted but we've had the poll open for about a minute and a half. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and close this poll now and I'm going to share the results with everyone. Sorry if you didn't get to vote, we still want to move on though. 29% of you are going to liquidate and take the profit, and there's nothing wrong with that. 18% of you are going to close half of the position or part of the trade. Still leave yourself to realize more upside if the stock continues on, but you're going to take a lot off that table uh, to have maybe a realized profit on the position, a much lower cost basis. 35% of you are going to sell a call generate income, you're going to lower the cost basis down. Now of course you may be in trouble to the upside. 6% of you are going to add more shares. Okay, So you're going to put more money where your mouth is for lack of a better term, you're going to look for higher upside. 12% of you point with maybe a 15 or 20% gain anytime you've hit maybe close to your target but you think there's a little bit more. 12% of you will place a trailing stop or maybe just do nothing and hope and pray. All right, well let's take a look at an example, comparing our answers and our ideas. What is the great thing about options, ladies and gentlemen? Well, they give us options. There are many trades, many ways to manage a position, protect a position, lock in a gain, generate income, and more. And having a gain on a position can be frustrating. It sounds stupid to say, we should all be so lucky, I realize that every time, but now that we have the gain, we've already seen it. We had almost an even split between our attendees today, our 40, 42 attendees right now, and the number's still growing, people are still jumping in, but we see that there's a different breakdown of how people would manage this. Some would liquidate and take the profit. Most would sell a call to generate income. Some would close half or part of the trade. Some would place a trailing stop. So is there a best way to manage the gain before the market corrects or put us in a position to take a gain, manage the gain, and still realize more? Well, let's consider Apple again. Let's consider the Apple position we saw on the first of our list. It was up about 25%. So on December 1st, we could have gone into Apple at 109.50 by buying the stock. Let's say that maybe you bought a March 17th call as well, maybe a 110, maybe a 105 call. But let's say we bought 100 shares of Apple at that price, we held it through the close even today. It's at about 137.25 today. It was at 137.11 on February 22nd. So if we open the shares of stock on February 22nd, we could have realized a goal of 27.61 or 25.2% of our 109. 50 investment. All right. So here we are at the last three months, almost a mirror image, not quite, but almost a mirror image of the stock chart that we saw on SPY. Right? We just got into the low point after that the little correction at the end of November, after that little short rally here, we had a slight correction. So here we are with Apple at 109.50 on around December 1st. We had that uh, you know, consolidation period here end of January, beginning of February. Now here with Apple, we got a little pop. 
but the direction was still the same we saw with SPY. Get a little bit more return percentage-wise on Apple due to that earnings pop that we had right around February 1st, it still continues to move up. Okay, all right, so here we are sitting on a gain, an unrealized gain of about 25% on Apple. So what are our approaches? Okay, we already talked about this. Do we close now and take the gain? Close half to reduce the cost. Sell a call at the 137 at the money, or maybe higher for further upside. Ben suggests selling a 114 or 115 call right now that's deep in the money. I'll take a look at that. Let me jot that down, Ben. So we're going to sell a call at uh, 115 strike deep in the money. I don't have that here, but we're going to take a look. All right. Do we add more? Do we do nothing? Or trailing stop? All right. Well, what else do we know? All right. We know the market is up. We know that we've got a 25% gain. Uh, there was a slight pullback today, not necessarily on Apple, but earlier this morning we saw the indexes kind of pull back a little bit. Now, Apple recently had earnings, so we don't need to worry about any sudden gaps within the next 20 to 30 to 40 days. Next earnings are going to be around April 20th, April 25th or so. Now, that does come into play with our analysis. All right? So, what could we do? Step number one, we could close now and take the gain. Sell Apple at around 137. We had a cost basis of 109.50. We're going to realize a gain of 27.50 per share. So for 100 shares, $2,750. That's a 25% return for an 83-day trade. That's not too bad at all. It probably matches most of our goals for an annualized return. Now we're talking close to a three-month period. So, of course, we're averaging about 8% per month. That's pretty strong. But are we at the market top? Does the stock have more room to grow? Or do we expect the correction very soon? Okay, unless we buy back in, we're going to miss further upside. We are probably happy with our gain. But if the correction does not come and it continues its trend, we miss out. All right, let's do some math here. This might get a little bit complicated, but let's walk through it. How about closing half or part of the trade? Remember, we bought 100 shares at 109.50, so our total investment would have been $10,950. Let's just ignore commissions for the moment. If we sold to close 50 shares now at 137, we're going to take in $6,850. So the cost basis on our remaining 50 shares is going to be $4,100, which gives us a new cost basis of $82 per share. And that's pretty nice. The stock's at 137. Okay, so we've got a cushion, large cushion on our, our shares. Now, could Apple fall below $82 per share in the next 20, 30, or 50 days? It's not likely. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to put fear into you. I'm not going <coughs> to base this webinar off on fear. I'm just going to base it on indecision. What can we do? What is available to do? So Apple's not likely to fall below $82 in the next 20, 30, or 50 days. Could it happen? Sure. Could you manage the 50 shares you have remaining? If you started off with 100 shares, of course. You could put a trailing stop on that as well. You couldn't sell a call right now unless you bought another 50 shares, but we would have approached that differently. Okay? So there's another idea. We know our cost basis is really low. Now, selling a call to reduce the price. And again, Ben, I don't have your example in here, but we're going to talk about getting the most bang for the buck with the time value using the at-the-money bell curve. So I own shares of Apple right now at 109.50. I could sell to open the March 17th standard expiration at 190. Happy St. Patrick's Day. My new cost basis would drop down to 107.60, and my max return, the stock stays at 137 or above, we're going to be at $29.40, 27.3%, about 2% higher than what we get right now for liquidating the position, a 25% gain. So that's a hefty, hefty profit. But remember, what's the problem with the at-the-money call, which Ben already mentioned, is that there's nothing beyond 137. And the profit is not guaranteed. Okay, so I'm going to pause for a moment. 
I'm going to pause the screen for a second and oh, I'm sorry folks I'm going to pause the screen for a second I'm going to navigate actually over to power options real quick I'm going to just jot these numbers down for us here and we're going to take a look at Ben's example as well and then we'll go back to our others All right so let's see am I showing the right screen here no I'm not now I am so in the custom spread tool at power options we're going to go ahead and put in our position we had the stock 100 shares at 109.50 now I showed selling the March 17 it's only 17 days away 137 call for around 190 that's what it was earlier this morning Ben had selected maybe what if we sold the 115 it's deep in the money six points above our cost basis and right now we've got a bit of 22 to 22.50 so let's say we get midpoint at 22.25 so let's put in our midpoint at 22.25 now we're drastically going to reduce our cost basis okay and we get a little bit higher return so we take our cost basis down to 87.25 by selling the deep in the money call now and if the stock stays above 115 we could make $2,775 or 31.8%. Okay, so it's about 4% higher than the at the money call if we were signed at 137. This gives us a little bit more cushion, doesn't it? Stock would fall to 115 and we'd still be making money on the position, the max return, and the break evens drop down to 87.25. So it is another alternative. But what are we saying here as well? We're also saying that we felt the stock has run its course and on March 17th we want to get out of it with a 31.8 percent return 6 percent higher than liquidating right now 4 percent higher than maybe selling the 137 call at the money but not getting that guarantee but in both cases we may be out of the stock in 17 days okay all right so that's we just wanted to throw that in for uh, bin there and we'll actually use that in other comparisons as well I just wanted to graphics I didn't have that example all right so that all being said let's head back now take a look at some of our other examples <sighs> do we add more shares well six percent said that you would do this so let's talk about how that might look and we might not do a full 100 but let's say we did what's our situation we own 100 shares of Apple at 109.50 that we purchased on December 1st we could add an additional 100 shares at 137 this would put our new cost basis per share at 123.25. So, but we have 200 shares. We now have a total of $24,661 from the 10,950 we initially had. Now, the profit, if the stock moves up to 140 on March 17th, it's going to be, you know, $3,338 or so, or 13.5%. That's going to be less than the covered call, but the upside's still open. So if the stock goes to 150, we're going to realize a little bit more profit. So the upside's still open, but so is the downside. Now what if Apple pulls back over a four-day period to 120? Only 16 points from where it is now. Okay, so if it falls back down to 120, we'd be at a loss. Of about $350. I'm sorry, yeah, we beat a loss about $325, my apologies, times two. So it'd be $650. Okay? And then, of course, we could do nothing. We could hold the stock at a cost of $109.50. We have unlimited upside, but we haven't reduced the cost basis as we could by adding a covered call. We haven't averaged up or laddered for more profit. We keep the risk and the break even the same. And of course, you may add a trailing stop at 135, but that's kind of close. What do I mean by that? What is the downfall of a stop order or even a trailing stop? Well, it's assumed insurance. It's not guaranteed protection. It's a little bit, but it's assumed insurance. What I mean by that is when I put a stop order now on my shares of Apple, trading at 137, I put in a stop at 135, I've told my broker that I want a market order. 
that if the stock's trading anywhere below 135, I want to get out of the position. We don't have earnings coming up. We don't have anything along those lines that might be a sudden shock, but as we know with the stocks, even something like Apple, even something like Google slash Alphabet, even something like IBM, even GE, the unexpected can happen. So I set my stop at 135, and the next two days, the stock stays at 137, and then over this weekend, a black swan event happens, something unexpected happens, find out that Apple kind of misled people based on their earnings. It's not likely, but remember, if the stock opens Monday at 120, this is a market order. I can't get filled at 135. It's, the market order is triggered. My broker says, oh, he needs to sell his shares of stock. It's at 119.85, so I get filled at 119.85, not at 135. Okay? So that's the risk. Now, again, we don't have earnings coming up. We don't have an event coming up where we'd expect that to happen. But the key is, is that just to remember that a trailing stop is assumed insurance. I'm sure all of you have been hurt by stop orders in the past where a stock gap down from an unexpected event you got filled at the price the market was trading at, not at your stop order because it just became a market order that was filled. All right, let's go one by one. Let's look at this on a table. What are our actions? Okay, well, we could liquidate. Our new cost would be zero. Right? We liquidate the shares 137. New cost basis is zero. We don't own anything. We've got a gain of $2,750 or 25% which if the market goes to 140, Apple goes to 150, or Apple goes to 105, hey, we took our gain off the table, we're happy with our eight month return, we were looking for other positions. Selling half, now what does that do for us? And we already saw we're gonna drastically reduce the cost basis to $82. Even with Ben's example of selling the 115 call for maybe February 17th, or even if we went further out in time, okay, we still had a higher cost base, about 87.25. So here selling half gives us the lower cost base, the lowest cost basis remaining on only 50 shares. So fair comparison, and why am I choosing March 17th? Because that's where we sold these calls, <laughs> okay? So on March 17th, the stock's at 140, you've got a profit of 2,900, more than we had by liquidating right now, and percentage-wise, it's higher. Why? Because remember, I only have 4,100 invested now in the position. So it's almost a 70% gain. It's almost using leverage, isn't it? If our stock goes up to 150, we'd have a profit of $3,400 on our 50 shares remaining, which would be 83%. And of course, if the stock now falls to 105, we have a drastic loss over time, our gain would be 1150 Okay, but 28%, so we have about half the gain, less than half the gain we would have by liquidating, but the percentage looks larger because we're comparing it to just the $4,100 that we had invested in our 50 shares now. Okay, there we go, sorry, I had to do something real quick here. Perfect, okay, I apologize, folks. All right, so there's the liquidation out at $2,750 could realize more monetary profit by selling half, but if there's a pullback, of course, we won't realize as much. Now, the covered call using the at-the-money bell curve, if we sold the at-the-money 137 call, we'd lower the cost basis to 107.60. Stocks at 140, we get assigned. We make that 27.3%. $200 higher than if we liquidated right now. That's the option premium, $1.90, plus maybe a little bit of in extrinsic value. If we're at 150, hey, guess what? We don't make any more upside. We're still at 29.40 on March 17th. And of course, if there's a drastic pullback down to 105, we're gonna end up losing $260 or 2.4%. Okay. So we'd still have profit on the first two, may realize a loss in the drastic pullback on the third one of selling the call. In Ben's example, we would have lowered the call spaces down to 87.25. With the stock fell to 105, 
we still have a profit of uh, what is that thirteen eighteen dollars roughly seventeen dollars and seventy five cents so seventeen hundred dollars not nearly as much as selling half or liquidating but more than selling half if the stock fell about six hundred dollars more all right buying more can be enticing but again let's say we did a hundred to a hundred ratio we bought another hundred shares at 137 now we've got a cost basis of 123 this goes back to that slide I mentioned earlier about what are your goals monetarily and percentage wise versus your risk tolerance so here I could see the most monetary profit if the stock was at 140 It'd be three thousand three hundred and fifty dollars but on my new investment of twenty four thousand dollars it's only a return of thirteen point five percent if the stock goes up to 150 we've made fifty three hundred dollars almost fifty four hundred dollars but again that's a twenty one point seven percent return it's not as high as the other three and if the stock pulls back to 105 we're at a loss of 36.50 or 14.8 percent okay so is your goal percentage is your gain monetary and how confident are you on your expectation the stock might continue up that we haven't reached the top yet but we may soon and if you're wrong is that worth the risk to add more shares in the position and of course doing nothing what does that give us okay well if the stock goes up to 140 we get three hundred dollars more profit okay 27.8 percent better than the at the money covered call not as good as the deep in the money call that Ben showed okay and we don't have any protection but we could make thirty three thousand fifty dollars with a stock at 140 17 18 days from now 27.8 percent stock goes up to 140 the second highest monetary gain 4,050 or 36.9% and of course if the stock falls to 105 well we have a loss of only 450 so three of these would result in loss the most one is buying more again how confident are you in your technical indicators and your market indicators going forward the two of the ones that realize a profit of course would be out of the position and wouldn't realize more upside and one of them would be using leverage where we drastically reduce the cost basis but now might be only holding 50 shares in order to do other adjustments of course maybe you had 400 shares you sold half so you have 200 shares you could still now sell the call the in the money 115 excuse me the at the money 107 but here's the side-by-side -side comparison of what to expect with our five answers and I wanted to show this table not only to get a good example of what we're doing but to illustrate for all of you the comparisons of if your plan is remember the 29% of you said if you had a gain of 15 or 16 or 20% in the stock 29% said we'd liquidate now this is just giving you a gauge so you know going forward of the stocks you've liquidated over the last year maybe in this scenario what would have happened if X or Y or Z if you would have sold half if you'd have done a covered call or if you would have bought more Okay. you know what your stocks did after you closed out maybe they did pull down as you expected and you timed it right maybe they continued up a little bit and then fell okay for those of you who sold half you can see the monetary comparisons now you're looking pretty good but at the same time remember you're not realizing the higher monetary profit but percentage wise you're beating everyone for the covered call we know the outcome we could get a good return even as high as 31.8 percent going deeper in the money with better protection okay and buying more we know the risks there as well all right now what about another idea <clears throat> sometimes we're caught up in the idea of when we have a gain we want to sell premium we want to generate income we want to lower the cost basis as we saw with the covered call that comes with a trade-off doesn't it trade-off is we miss further upside so now that I have a gain in my stock what if we decided to try to lock in that gain guarantee a profit by of course purchasing a put option several months out in time so here we are with Apple at 137 it's up 25 percent if I went out now and bought an August 140 put at 970 my new cost basis would be 119.20 now other than buying 
another 100 shares of stock, this has the highest new cost basis on the position. But I'm guaranteed to get 140 back, even if the stock falls because of a black swan event or an unexpected event, it drops to 120 overnight, over the weekend, and on Monday morning, when we turn on our screens, we see that Apple's trading at 120. If I had the stop order at 135, I get filled at 120 with the put, the guaranteed profit in place, the guaranteed exit at 140, we're guaranteed $20.80 or 17.4%. Have I capped my upside gain as I did with selling a call? No, the upside profit is still unlimited. And I've locked in a gain, a guarantee of 17.4, 17.5%, even if the stock falls back to 109.50 or even lower. Okay, so what does that look like graphically? We had a cost basis at 109.50. That was our original purchase price. Stock has moved up, and we bought the 140 put out to August. Okay, so now, if the stock continues to move up, we didn't call the market top necessarily, but we've put ourselves in a position, instead of taking a 25% gain right now, we've guaranteed that we're going to make 17.5%, even if the stock falls back to 100, 109, or if the stock fell to $82. Again, highly unlikely, but we've seen stranger things happen as well. So now we have a locked in gain. Now what's showing you here, the hockey stick graph, the blue hockey stick graph here, this is showing us at expiration. The worst case scenario is I'll make 17.4 percent and that's if I hold the position all the way to August, do nothing else except no dividends if there's any dividends coming and the stock is below 140. 17.5% is the worst that I can do. This curved red line is showing us the profit and loss at the halfway point, May 25th, 2017. So here we see that we have a higher profit at the halfway point. Why? Because properly structured the position to put time on my side. Rather than buying a one week out, two week out, or three week out option, put option, and then continuing to buy it week by week, Buying six months out in time, I did pay that higher price, but it's a lower cost per day. The option that's six months out in time is not six times the cost of the near-term options. That's why when we sell, we want to sell week by week or month by month to get a better annualized return. And when I buy, I want to buy that further out in time. Now, Mike says, you were giving up a whopping 8%. Okay, so yeah, that premium I paid was 8%. It's very expensive for insurance. Aren't you not better off selling now for 8% higher and then take the extra profit and buy calls? Well, no. Yes and no, Mike. Here's the problem. Well, not the problem. Here's the answer. Mike, am I down 8% right now? Absolutely not. I paid 970 for that August put. Yes, I increased my cost basis, but that increased cost basis to 119, 70, 119, 20, only occurs at expiration, August. I bought that put today for 970. Come Monday, if the stock's at 135, I'm going to be able to sell that put for maybe 920, maybe 930. Okay, I'm not losing one-to-one -one with the put. I am not down 970 when I enter this position. If I bought a weekly put and the stock fell, then yes, that put might go to zero if it drops below the strike. I'm sorry, rises above the strike, that put would go to zero. If this put moves up, I'm sorry, if the stock might moves up to 140 in the next five days, my put's still going to be worth 840 or 850. That's why I'm buying it further out in time. It's just an asset. And you're right, Mike, it's 8% at expiration. Is my plan now? to hold this all the way to August and do nothing. Absolutely not. I'm going to be able to make adjustments on that. Okay, and Mike, my Mike says good point. So I agree with you, Mike. If I was showing you buying a one week out 135 put and the stock fell to 136, I'd lost whatever I would have paid in the put position. It would go to zero very rapidly. If I bought the March 17th 
I might have only paid a dollar fifty for a one thirty five put. I might pay four dollars for the one forty. I'm paying nine dollars for insurance out to August. Okay. All right. Okay. So Ben, you're asking the right questions, but I'm going to ask you to stay with me because every question you're asking, I've got an answer for coming right up. Okay. So let's take a look at this chart. Where are we now? We're guaranteed at least to make 17.4% in the worst case scenario. We still have unlimited upside. Okay, so regardless of what happens, we've got 17% locked in. It's not the full amount as Mike mentioned. I could take 25% off the table right now. Maybe I could take some of that profit and buy calls, but guess what? The percentage gain won't be the same, but the monetary gain of taking the profit and buying calls now is going to be equal to what I just showed you over time. Okay, percentage, it's going to look much better. I agree with it. That's what leverage is. Okay, but leverage works both ways. I can still take advantage of further upside. That put doesn't go to zero if the stock moves up two points because I put time on my side and bought the August put. I haven't closed the position or capped the gain. Now, I didn't call anything, did I? I didn't call the market top in this scenario. I didn't say that, yes, tomorrow it's going to fall another five points, another six points, another three points, and three weeks from now, we're going to be down 10%. No, I didn't call the market top. But have I entered into a structure that's the same, where I'm guaranteeing a profit? But if I'm wrong and the market continues up, it doesn't correct, I still have further upside to that as well. Okay? Okay, Mike says, uh, follow-up question I'll get to at the end, but I'm going to address it now, Mike, just so you know that I'm thinking about it. But how do you decide how deep in the money you want to go with your put? Is it a judgment call? Is there a method to the madness? There is sort of a method to the madness. And another method that goes to that, I'm showing what I might do with the expectation that maybe I'm wrong. We haven't hit the market top in the next two or three months. The stock might continue up. So why am I not buying a cheap March put? Because it could keep going up for two months, that only gives me an insurance for 17 days. What if it goes up more than three months? Well, buying the April or buying the May put might miss out on some extra side. Okay, So why pay this much to go further out in time? It's because remember, if the stock even does fall to 120, my 140 put will have $20 of intrinsic. Let's say it falls to 120. Well, I'll show you that in a minute, but even 105, remember, my put will go to the intrinsic value, but I still have four or five months of time value remaining on the option. So how do you decide how deep in the money you want to go? And is a judgment call their method to the madness? Well, there is a further adjustment, adjustments I could use, and that's why I'm maybe not going too deep in the money. I could buy a 180 put right now and probably lock in higher profit. But then trying to do anything else over the next 17 days, 20 days, or 30 days is going to be very difficult. If I sold a call at any reasonable strike, owning that deep in the money 180 put, the structure of my trade is going to change completely, and I might actually be able to lose on the upside because I've capped the gain in the wrong place. So the answer to your question is, it does depend a little on your expectation. And it does depend on how much longer you want to stay in the stock. Okay? And, and Ben, Ben says another option, you're right, we're not going to get into the day. He mentioned another of the 12 different income methods that we use here at Radioactive Trading. But let's move forward. What did I do? It's a proper structure to lock in gains and leave the upside open. I can trade further without fear. I have no fear of overnight drops that I might even have with a trailing stop. Because remember, the trailing stop or the stop order is simply a market order to close you out at what stop you selected at whatever the stock is trading at. 15 to 20% decline, I don't get filled at my 132 or 133 stop with the stock at 137, I get filled at whatever the market's ordering. Here, at any time, I can sell to close the put and the stock, I can liquidate it, or I can exercise it at any time, okay? All right, so it's better than a trailing stop. Mike, give me a couple minutes, okay? I want to get through this, and then I'm going to show you some examples and some things there as well. And it might be a little bit more clear too. All right, so confidence and comfort going forward. I can sleep with ease. I can go into any event. I could even hold this all the way through the next earnings in April, knowing I'm guaranteed to make a 17% return. 
and I can still have further upside, okay? Then, guaranteed profit, of course, with unlimited upside. All right, so, by the way, Ben had mentioned this, and there's other, there's, you know, probably eight, six or seven other adjustments I could make after I lock the stock in position, but let's just keep it simple. We could still generate that $1.90 from the covered call. I still have the stock. I have a guaranteed profit and a guaranteed exit of 140. If I feel the stock could be trading around 140, that you know, stock has had this run. Here we are thinking we're at the market top and we're not sure. We're seeing some indicators that might look at a correction, might point to a correction, but we're not 100% sure. We feel the next 10 or 15 days, things might continue up. We don't know the future, we can't know the future. So what are we looking at here? Well, if I think the stock might still be around this 140, even 141 or 138 range, why not, now that I've guaranteed an exit, take in another $1.90? I could sell to open the March 17th 140 call. I'm sorry, that's a 137. Originally, we showed the 137. I did one thing and then did another, and I'm going to show both. But I could sell that 137 call, the at the money for 190. My new cost basis, what I invested in the stock at 109.50, that $9.50 I paid for the put, and then the 190 in, takes us to a cost basis of 117.30. And my guaranteed exit now is at 140 still, so our new potential profit is 29.11 or 24.8%. Now I'm highlighting that, I put an asterisk next to it, because that is the max potential profit. Now this structure, again, what do I own? We own stock at 109.50. Okay, so we have a cost basis of 109.50 on the stock. We bought a 140 put for 970, I think it was, and then we sold the 137 at 190. Okay, so essentially, but this is March and this is August. So this kind of looks like a little calendar spread profit loss chart, doesn't it? Okay, but. Remember, I have a guaranteed profit to the downside no matter what happens. And the max return here on March 17th is if the stock's trading right at 137. So let's say it's right at 137. The call expires worthless, but my put, where's this extra return coming from? Okay, the stock at 137, even if we got assigned at 137 with our cost basis of 117, well, that's only roughly a $20 profit. Where's this extra $800, $900 coming from? And that's because even if the stock's at 137 on March 17th, our 140 put is still going to have a value of $850, $850. It didn't go to zero. It didn't just go to intrinsic value. We still have five months of time value plus the three dollars of intrinsic value and of course if the stock moves up we can still realize a profit but why are we sloping downwards well it's because of the obligation of the call so at March expiration if the stocks at 140 my put does still decline at this price it might be worth six dollars it might be worth seven dollars somewhere in that range okay with the stock at 140 now still five months of time value it didn't go to zero we still have a lot of time value in that option but we didn't gain that $3 extra. We didn't have a positive delta as we did with just the stock and the put combination. The call goes to a delta of one. So that $3 extra move in the stock, we don't realize because of our obligation at 137 and the put still declines. So that's why we come off of that maximum profit. So we could still generate the 190 and we could increase our return as we saw. But a better approach I feel and one of the reasons why I mentioned to Mike that I chose the 140 is that it's easier to do other adjustments. So now, even though I'm not getting as much premium, I have the put at 140. So if I sell the 140 call equal to or above my put strike price for only 70 cents, I only take the cost basis down to 118.50. And that's the max return if the stock's at 140 now but that goes up to a 24.8%, okay? So that's a different combination to look at. By selling the call below the put strike price, we sort of 
took away some of the potential gain if the stock keeps moving up. So again, have I called the market top? Do I know the market top is going to be at 140 in 17 days? No. But I've pretty much entered a trade where I look like I've called the market top, can still profit in either direction even if the stock falls 20 or 30 percent, if the stock moves up another 5 or 10 percent, or if the stock stays the same. Okay, so once again, a quick review, and you guys might be getting sick of seeing these numbers, and I realize that, but here's our first five again. We'd be out at 27.50 if we liquidated. We have potential for more monetary profit if we sold half, and the leverage return looks phenomenal. Doing the covered call, and we are looking at the at the money 137 here, we could lock in that gain of 29.40 if and only if the stock stayed above 137. There's no guarantee. And if the stock pulls back to 105, well, then we're in a loss. If you buy more, you could see more monetarily, but that's going to lead to less percentage-wise. So do you want a monetary return of a higher investment, or do you want percentage return? And the risk is the highest if the stock pulls back from an unexpected event. Do nothing, still the potential to loss. Okay, now, why are we showing this? Well, if this here, this radioactive listing, is just buying our August 40 put, I'm sorry, 140 put, my apologies. So, of course, we increase our cost basis to 119.20, and 8%, as Mike mentioned. But remember, that 8%, that whopping 8% increase, that put doesn't go to zero until we hit August expiration. So, on March 17th, if the stock's at 140, I'd still have a gain of 28.67. Not as high as doing nothing, not as high monetarily as buying more, but percentage-wise it's more. About equal to selling the covered call alone, about equal monetarily to selling half, and more than liquidating right now. And what about if the stock goes to 150? Well, now we're higher monetarily than selling the half at only 34. Profit would be 34.84. On March 17th, the stock goes up to 150, 29.2%. Less than doing nothing, okay? Also, less than buying more, but percentage-wise, we're higher, more than doing the covered call. And, once again, more than liquidating. And now, what happens if the stock pulls back to 105? Well, where we'd have a loss on our covered call, where we'd have a loss on buying more, where we even have a loss on doing nothing, we still have a profit of $2,000 or 17.8%. Again, not as high as liquidating right now, I'll admit that. But every other time we outperformed liquidating right now over the next 10 or 15 days, by adding the put option. And as Mike says, that sounds counterintuitive. How can I make more if the stock goes up to 140 if I paid $9 for the put? Because most of that $9, literally close to uh, 66%, about $6.40 of that $9, 970 you paid for the put is time value. The $3 you're guaranteed to get back. And in 17 days, you're not going to see much time decay. Okay? So, you know, monetarily, we can outperform liquidating right now. Percentage-wise, it's different because we increase the cost basis. And if the stock moves up further, better profit than liquidating right now. And if the stock falls, not as much. But we could still do other adjustments in this case and continue the trade because we've got insurance out to August and a guaranteed profit. And then, of course, here, if we sold the call, and again, this is based on selling the 140 call at 70 cents, we reduce the cost basis to 118.50 after we buy the put, you know, just selling it to 70 cents or so. Oh, my math's not right there. I apologize. Yeah, you know, it's right. I'm sorry. This is selling the at the money 140. The one I said was a better one for the higher return. We outperform liquidating right now by March 17th with the put and the short call in place. Now we get less if it goes to 150 because remember we capped the gain and at the same time, we still have a strong return, not as high as liquidating, but a return where we would have a loss in any of the other combinations.
So what is really calling the market top? There's nothing wrong, I admit, with getting out right now, taking the gain if you've met your goals, and then maybe to wait to see when the correction happens. You might be sitting on the sidelines for two months in cash. But if the market continues to go up before it declines, you can realize a higher profit than liquidating right now by actually buying the put and locking in a gain or buying the put and adding the short call or another adjustment to the position and knowing that even if the stock pulls back you can't watch that 27 25 percent unrealized gain in 17 days disappear into a loss a slight loss here by selling half or I'm sorry not half by doing the covered call or an extreme loss if you add more you guarantee double digit profits going forward in this scenario you can realize further upside that outperforms monetarily liquidating right now and still have the opportunity to do other adjustments okay so again that's the now did I call the market top that is the now that is a way that you can call the market top but what about the beginning well, I could have started with that married put setup initially on December 1st. I could have bought the stock at 109.50, maybe bought a 115 put or a 110. I probably would have gone with the 115 and only had a 5% risk in the worst case scenario. And as the stock moved up, I already showed you how that August put would lose intrinsic value, but I'm not really losing the time value. So I could have manipulated that put and adjusted it from 115 to 120, added a little bit of cost basis, but only had a 2% risk, then gone from the 120 to the 130, and probably had zero risk at that point, or a bulletproof status. And as the stock moved up to 137, I could still continue the trade, and I might be locked in now to a guaranteed profit of 15 or 20%. Had I started as a married put from the beginning, I could have bulletproofed the trade and probably had an 8% guaranteed profit an unlimited upside when the earnings came out and it jumped up to 132 and 133. So going into earnings with no fear of risk, a guaranteed profit to the downside if the stock fell 20% or continued to move up. And the opposite happens, okay? Uh, one of my positions I mentioned is UBNT. On January 27th, I opened this as a married put. I bought stock at 61.75. I bought the June 65 put for 765. So there's my total investment of 6940 and I had a guaranteed exit of 65. So my max risk was 6.3%. As Mike says, well, I'm putting a whopping 6.3% in for insurance. Okay, but remember, the put is not just insurance, is it? It's a second asset that works in my favor. So after earnings 10 days ago, UBNT dropped to 53. This is Ubiquity Networks, by the way, and is now trading at 49.16. So we're down 20.4% on this position. I could take it off the table right now for a loss of only 5%, 5.8%, almost 6%. Not the full loss, pretty close to it because of the 20% decline. But there's a way I can adjust that position right now so I can lower my cost basis in the stock down to about $52 and I could do another adjustment where if the stock's trading at around $50 per share on March 17th, 17 days from now, even with the stock down 20%, I was long stock the entire time, I could have a 1% or 2% profit with my cost basis at 61.75 and paying that extra 6% or 8% for the put. Because the put's just not insurance, it is a second working asset. So using the put, when you have a gain in the stock, remember, what are we looking at here? We're looking at a way that monetarily you can exceed liquidating now in a short time frame, 10, 15, 30 days out in time. You're going to increase your cost basis, but then if the stock falls, you're still guaranteed a profit. So you can realize more to the upside and still guarantee a profit to the downside. And we could still do other adjustments, sell a call, maybe do a spread against the stock and put position, maybe even do a ratio spread against the stock and put position to realize further upside and a guaranteed profit no matter what happens next on the position. That's what is a different alternative. That's what is possible. And 
Are we paying more to pick that up? Absolutely, but what does it give us? No fear of earnings, a black swan, or an unexpected event. We can stay in the position expecting further upside and guarantee profit if a correction comes. But in the meantime, in the next 10 or 15 days, we can generate a little bit more than liquidating right now. We can't predict the future, but we're trading like we have a crystal ball. If the stock continues to move up, I can see more profit. If it falls back as I expected, I'm still guaranteed double-digit profits. And it's controlling losses. And remember, from the beginning, if I had opened this as a married put from the beginning, I could have made adjustments and had no risk now. But what is the only thing I can control in the market? It's not how many wins I have and how many losses. The market's going to dictate that no matter what your strategy is and what your technical and fundamental indicators are. Can you control the amount of money you're going to make? No, the market dictates that as well. You enter a bull put spread that's out of the money and has an 80% probability, you can tell me that there's an 80% chance that you're going to make 11, 12, or 15% against the leverage spread. I'd agree with you. Not every one of your bull put spreads is going to be profitable. If you open 100 trades over the year, you're only going to be right 80% of the time. The wins and losses balance that out. This is the best way to protect gains. A stop order can be good if you think we're in a neutral market and you don't have to pay anything for it. But if the stock collapses, remember, your stop order or your trailing stop are simply a market order. That's all it is. And now that I've guaranteed the profit on the position, we can still do other option strategies that we may be doing right now. I could still sell that call. I could still do a spread trade against the position. I could do other adjustments as well. Uh, Mike, there's, there's, there's a problem with your comment. Okay, okay, okay. Mike says, I had another thing. If you bulletproof a position where we showed that profit and loss chart where I have no risk on the position, Let's go back a little bit. Let me pause the screen and go back, folks. I just want to get to where we would be on our original Apple position that we insured. Okay, here we go. So if I bulletproof the position where I have no loss, I have a guaranteed profit to the downside and unlimited upside. He says the good news is you're certain of no loss. The bad news is, is that you limit the upside in comparison to doing nothing. Okay, well, my, yeah, my upside is not limited. But if I did nothing and the stock was at 140, what I see more by doing nothing than by adding the put? Yes, I would. Okay, here we are again. Remember, if the stock goes to 150, if I did nothing, we'd have a profit of $4,050 or 36.9%. Whereas on the married put, I'm getting more upside still, but not as much. I'm about $500 lower. So again, like this comes to the question of, how well do you trust your judgment in these situations? How well do you trust your technical, fundamental, and other indicators that you use? Because if you're right, sure, you're going to realize more profit if you do nothing, if the stock continues to 150. But if you're wrong, the stock pulls back, where are you at? And how much do you want to put, how much of your money do you want to risk on your technical and fundamental indicators? Now, I'm not trying to sugarcoat the fact that it costs me money. I'm not sugarcoating the fact it's going to cost me $970, maybe with commissions close to $1,000 or $985 to buy the put and increase my cost basis. What I'm saying is with the three outcomes that are possible when you're unsure of the market direction, which one of these best suits your goals, your risk tolerance, and your confidence in your technical indicators? I know my answer. Even though selling half looks really good. Okay, so you can still make leverage return $2,900, $3,400, and still have a profit here. I know that looks good, and I'm not arguing that. What I'm saying is that maybe there's a better way. And we can still do other options transactions. Of course, this is based on owning 100 and selling half to only have 50 left. So now I can't sell a call against those 50 shares unless I want to take on a naked call and risk a lot to the upside, right? You know, because only half of... Uh, your obligation would be covered by the stock as well. And yeah, of course, we're not expecting Apple to go to zero, but Ben has got a point. Selling half is risky if the stock goes to zero. Yeah, if the stock fell back to $70 per share or $60 per share, would be at a loss. Here, I'm still guaranteed a profit. 
Okay, so I want to do one thing real quick. I know we've gone over. Um, I just want to show something very quickly here. So, one thing you can do for free today, if you have not done so already, if you have a stock that's up, you can go over to powerop.com slash RAT. Right? If you don't already, not already a subscriber, you don't already have a 14-day free trial, you can take a 14-day free trial to Power Options. And when you log on to Power Options, go to the Married Put tab. And there's a tool there called the Insurance Tool. And this will easily and quickly allow you to see what gains you would have locked into your stock if you have a stock that's up in price, if you bought a put right now. Okay, so let me show an example. And this is for everyone's benefit, but Mike, this kind of answers your question you asked a little while ago. I'm going to go to Power Options here. I'm going to go to Married Put tab. And I'm going to go to the Insurance tool. And let's take our example for the time being. So I'm going to put an AAPL. And I'm going to put in a cost basis of 109.50. And, Mike, as I mentioned, I'm going to select all months. Now, in that brief moment, what this tool did is went out and looked at every possible combination of put option that could be used. And this might be a little bit daunting at first. Now, Mike, I could lock in more of that profit that we were talking about if I just went out to March 17th, March 24th, went to a standard expiration. Um, or one of the weeklies. Okay, here's the three week out, 140 for 395. Okay, so that's 24 days of protection. If the market still goes up, we can still realize a profit, and we've guaranteed 23.4%. Why did I choose the August? Well, it's because if I wanted to stay in the position farther, or if I wanted to stay in the position through April expiration, think about this. Remember, my August put the August 140, I apologize, was at a price of 970. 24 days out, the 140 put is a price of $4. It's not quite half, but we're talking about 24 days of insurance at $4 versus going out to August, which is roughly 171 days on time. So we're six times the amount of time and we're only paying about twice as much for the same insurance, the 140. Okay? So sure, you could choose shorter term. Now, what is the difference? Let's just go to March, okay, for the short term. And Mike asked a question earlier of why would you go, how deep in the money should I go? And yes, this is showing just paying the ask, and I would never pay the ask either. I never do when I open a married put or a put option, Mike. But which one did I choose and why? Well, the stock's at 137. And what do we know about options in general? Well, there's a prime core principle we use in radioactive trading which should apply to every trade, and that's at the money, the at the money bell curve. And what does this mean? Is that the option that's at the money will have the highest time value. Okay, across all the chains. The, in this case, the higher strike puts, the in the money puts, are going to have a higher cost. But see, the 140 put here for March is at $4. Let's just be nice. $3 of that is intrinsic value, so I'm only paying $1 of time premium. I'm guaranteed to get the other three back because I bought a 140 put with a stock at 137. The 137 put is at 210 regardless if it's midpoint or ask, let's just use this example. So that's twice the amount of time value. So by going slightly in the money, I'm paying less time value, and that higher price is intrinsic value, which I'm guaranteed to get back. So why not buy, let's say, the 130 put at 38 cents? It's all the way down here. Okay? Well, it's a cheap price, but I'm only locking in 18.3%, which is still good. But here I'm guaranteed 22, 23%. Here I'm guaranteed 23.5. So again, this does come down to a trade-off of what do you think is valuable versus cost based on your expectations. But here what I'm trying to do is say, I think the stock may have run its course at 137. I think Apple's still strong. But if the market has a correction as the rising tide lifted everything up, it's going to pull everything down. So I'm trying to maximize guaranteed profit. 
Now, earlier I had mentioned, Mike, that we could probably go to the 150, 160, or 180 put. Why wouldn't I do that and lock in maybe close to all of this profit? Let's go back to August. Real quick, because there's other, we'll have this a conversation another time. See, the 155 put, even that far out in time, locks in about 20% of the profit, 19.3%. At midpoint, we could get a little bit better. So why am I not doing that? Why am I not going with the highest locked in profit? Because the stock's only at 137. All right, so here's the 155 put, that locked in profit. Mike, let's take a look at the bid ask here for August for you. Not much, 2010 to 2045, but instead of paying 2045, you and me are going to pay 2030. Okay, close enough to midpoint. So it gives us a 19.4% locked in profit. But now I want to generate a little bit extra profit. I've guaranteed myself 19.4% to August. You see that that slope doesn't start kicking in until we get up to 140, 145, 150, where we start to realize better profit. That one strike in the money is giving us a better kind of scale there. But at the same time, let's say you wanted to generate some profit now, and you wanted to go with the 140 call for March 17th at 70 cents, just as we did before. Have I called the market top now? Well, I'm kind of saying that I think the stock will cap out at 140, only 28.54, 22%. And look what's happening here. We're losing and losing more money. Why? Because remember, even if the stock goes up to this higher price, you lose the delta once the stock crosses 140. You have no more positive delta because your obligation of the call and the stock continues to go up. Can you sell a 155 call now? Sure, but what are you going to get? Two cents? Four cents? That's why you don't want to go too deep in the money. You ruin the expectancy of profit, even though you can lock in a higher percentage, guaranteed profit of 22 or 19 percent, instead of what we saw was 17 and 18 percent using the 140. But it makes no sense to do other adjustments now unless the stock goes to 155. And that's not where we're at. We're at a point where we think the stock might continue up a little bit over the next 17 to 30 days. We want to take advantage of that but we want to guarantee profit to the downside in case we're wrong and the stock pulls back. Okay, So again, the insurance tool will give you examples and you can kind of gauge just by the sight of it what works best for you. Now I chose August because that would extend me through the April earnings series. And I could maybe go to June as well for a little bit cheaper price to lock in a little bit more, 19.5%, and have that guaranteed profit still going through earnings 60 to 55 days from now around April 25th. So stay in the position if I'm wrong and the market continues up, realize further upside. If the market falls, that's okay. I've got a guaranteed profit. I can still make other adjustments. And if the stock does nothing between now and April, yeah, maybe sure I'm holding up some, um, I apologize, I'm uh, holding a lot of capital in place on the position. But at the same time, if earnings are positive, in April, and I see the gain that I want, I still have unlimited upside, and if it completely collapses, I still have a 20% guaranteed profit. Okay, And that's what we look for on those positions. That's another way, an alternative way. That is, in my opinion, the best way to actually call the market top, to say that I can guarantee this amount of profit here. And remember that 17% compared to the 25% I had, that 17% was the worst case scenario to August expiration. We saw that if the stock moved up or even fell to August, I'm sorry, at May 17th, March 17th, 17 days from now, then of course we'd still have a larger profit than that worst case scenario of 17%. Okay. Let's see. Let me just let me just ask real quick here. You're not going to offend me. I just want to know how well I did or if I gave you an alternative. Now that you've seen the comparisons, what are you going to consider mainly doing the next time you have a stock that's up 15 to 20%? Are you going to do the same, maybe liquidate and take the profit? Are you going to close half? You could really lower that cost basis as we showed on Apple down to $82 per share. but you could still potentially lose or not make as much. Would you sell a call only? 
still just to generate the income, or as Ben mentioned, selling that in the money cover call. Are you going to use a trailing stop order, or are going to consider adding a put to effectively call the market top, still realize further upside if it moves up, but know that you've guaranteed a profit. And by doing it correctly, the guaranteed profit is your worst case scenario if you held it for six months out. Uh, Mike, uh, your question regarding a, a fee service, a mentoring service, right now we don't have one available. Uh, after I get some other projects done, Ernie and I are going to get into that as well. Okay. Um, Mike says, that, and I don't mean to laugh at this, Mike, it, I didn't mean it to come out that way, but Mike says, the problem is that I seldom have winning positions, another issue altogether. And it is. But remember a couple slides ago what I showed. What is the one thing we can control, Mike, in the market as investors? Can we tro control how often we're going to win? No. Can we control how much profit we're going to make on our winners? No. You can set a stop, but you might never hit that. I could put a stop on my stock at a 15% gain or 5% loss. I might never hit the 15% gain, so when do I take it off the table? Or could I control the risk first properly, not even considering a stop order, which is assumed insurance, but use the proper structure, and even if the stock falls 20%, I could only lose 5 or 6% on the position, and for the positions that move up, I can still realize 60 to 70% of the big winners, maybe more. How would that change your plan? All right, let me go ahead and close the poll. Wow, I guess I did a decent job. 8% of you would still sell a call only, and that's perfectly fine. In Ben's example of we had a stock at 109, it went up to 137, going halfway between selling the 115 in the money call, generate $22, take the cost basis down to 87.25. That was a good one, but we didn't realize more profit than what we would have locked in, and it was about 31.8%. It looked really good. But 92% of you said that the next time you have a gain in your underlying stock, maybe even your underlying call, you're going to add a put to effectively call the market top. All right, fantastic. So the full story, I'm going to encourage you, remember, to go to powerop.com slash RAT. If you haven't done so already, check it out. You just need first name, last name, and email address, no credit card. And you can have a 14-day free trial to Power Options. You can go to Married Put. Use that insurance tool to see what locked-in profit that you have. But starting from the beginning, opening positions to properly control risk, and then using the 12 different adjustments that we, some of them we talked about today, are, of course, only available in the blueprint. That's the full work that describes it. And you'll be able to watch this webinar review. We'll post the archive. And at any time, you could go to RadioactiveTrading.com and click on the blog and see more information about expectancy versus profit, the benefit of controlling risks to begin with, and we've already shown today the benefits of a different way to approach managing a gain, to effectively lock in the profit, call the market top, where even if you're wrong, you could still see higher profits to the upside and guarantee most of the profit you'd get from liquidating right now to the downside, even if the correction is hard and fast as well. By the way, we could, of course, do a subtly different adjustment where we could profit in both directions. So instead of just locking in a guaranteed profit, we could realize more to the downside if the correction does happen without affecting too much to the upside as well. But if you're considering the blueprint, if you're considering making this, not only adding the puts from stocks you have gain on, but controlling risk from the beginning the proper way. Consider picking up the blueprint. Go to radioactivetrading.com slash iridium, and you'll be able to see the different bonuses that we have available for you right now. Uh, you can get a free month of power options. Uh, we're going to send you a free mastery series video, one of the six that Kurt put together, in addition to other benefits and other bonuses that we have right now uh, for further education and, of course, taking advantage of uh, fusion service as well. Okay. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining me today. I did archive today's presentation. I'll send you all an email when it's posted at around 4 p.m. Eastern time. If you have a question at any time, please feel free to send me an email to support at radioactivetrading.com. And remember, you can also call us during market hours at 302-992-7971. Thank you for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. Mike, Ben, thank you for uh, your questions and your comments as well. Um, 
Uh, Frank, I'm sorry, I just lost a, uh, lost something. I didn't lose it. Uh, I apologize. Frank had a, a comment here. Okay, uh, he says I can say with complete honesty, if I used a collar trade, I would have not lost on four accounts in the last five years. I I would have no loss four accounts in the last 15 years. I used a collar trade in my IRA in the year 2000, made 70%, still have the IRA. Uh, I believe you can outsmart the market. Well, I agree with you. But in a sense, the one thing I can control is the risk. I've had positions, Frank, where I don't want to say I've done the wrong thing. I trade collars. Standard collars was still about 15 to 20 percent of my trading capital. 50 of that, 50 percent of my trading capital is the radioactive trades and married puts. Um, I always had a good example a couple months ago. Nah, it was almost a year ago. I'd say eight months ago. I entered two new positions. One I entered as a standard collar. One I entered as a married put. The married put moved up 2 percent and I made a 1.5 percent profit. The collar shot up 10 percent in a 17-day period, and I made 2.3%. Had I reversed them, I still would have made 2% on my collar. If I had done the collar on the other stock, and if I had done a married put on the other, I'd have, I would have had a 10 or 12% gain, not even doing any adjustments on the position. So, can I beat the market? Not necessarily. But what I know, and why I've been trading this way in my personal account with the radioactive trade, leaving the upside open first before selling the call or doing any other adjustments, is because I'm stacking the market odds in my favor. Collars are good, and that's why I still use them, but in order to be profitable on the collars, I've had a 68.5%, 69% win ratio. I've outperformed that portfolio using married puts and radioactive trading positions because I realize a lot more of the upside than I do on a standard collar and still control my risk to 4 or 5% on the downside. The reason why, for the past 7, 8 years since I was introduced to radioactive trading, I use 50% of my portfolio with radioactive trades and not with collars, is because it's outperforming the collars, because there's more upside to be realized without having to buy back the call and roll it in the collar when the stock does move up. Okay, So I'm not claiming that I can beat the market, but this is the only structure I know where I can stack the market odds in my favor where I could be wrong more often than right by controlling risk to single digits and still make a profit. If I only had a 47% win ratio and I controlled my risk to 4% and made 6% on my winners, I'd still be at a profit. That's the power of using the put for insurance. And remember, it's not just insurance. It's the second asset you can manipulate if you put time on your side following the rules in the blueprint. But I thank you for your comment, Frank, and uh, I hope that... Uh, we do start seeing a little bit more success for you there um, with the collars. But remember, collars still have the problem with the covered call where you cap the upside, so you don't always realize the upside gain. Sometimes there are better approaches, and that's why I use 50 to 60% of my trading portfolio with radioactive trades. Still trade collars because I love them, but with only about 10 or 15% of my trading capital. And of course, yes, if I have a married put a radioactive trade and I sell a call, it's technically a collar, but it's more of a calendar collar than a standard collar, but that's all semantics. <laughs> all right. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. Have a fantastic afternoon. I will email you when the webinar is posted. Take care. Have a fantastic evening. Happy trading.